If you would, please, then let's turn to chapter 5. And let's look at, start to look at nonverbal. We'll look at nonverbal today and Thursday. And then there'll be a test of nonverbal, and we will have finished our first unit. Right when I thought we were going to do it. We're not going to do exercises with everything. So I'm just going to highlight for you uh, a few items and raise issues of critical thought. Um, as we look at nonverbal, uh, the um, very first page, 93, Take a look at the five statements in that first section of 93. Without reading below, just read those five statements again. Even if you've read this chapter thoroughly, you'll, you'll benefit from going back. Statement one is, nonverbal communication conveys more than verbal communication. What do you think? Is that true? Yes. Nonverbal conveys more than verbal. Yes. What do you think? Okay. Many of you will say yes, all right? Mm -hmm. Liars avoid eye contact. Yes. That's a lie. No. Not always. Most liars avoid. No. That's a not this game. Right? Okay. Very Many of us believe that that is true. Many of us believe that that is true. Studying nonverbal communication will enable you to detect lying. Certainly, uh, Fox News uses that uh, uh, extensively. They, they bring on so-called experts in body language, and, and they will point out things about those people, about the people that have been interviewed to indicate they're lying or they're, they're less than truthful. What do you think? To some extent. Will this uh, uh, enable you to detect liars? Might not in all cases. I say body language tells more than eyes. Okay. There's a, a wonderful scene. I, I had a chance to watch Godfather again over the break. It's my favorite movie. So, so there's this wonderful scene when Michael comes back after, Vito, uh, after Vito's death and he confronts his brother-in-law and he says, I know you're lying. Don't lie to me. He, and you go, how do you know he's lying? Maybe it's the nonverbal stuff. Online verbal communication, nonverbal communication is universal throughout the world. Is that true? Yes. No. Some of you are saying yes, some are saying no. When verbal and nonverbal message contradict, it's wise to believe the nonverbal. Yes, no? What do you think? DeVito labels all five of these as myths. They all are all things that we like to believe when we casually think about nonverbal communication. But if we think a little bit more, we'll think, we'll realize, no, well, this isn't true. <coughs> nonverbal doesn't convey more information than verbal communication, but it supplements our verbal communication and sometimes reinforces sometimes complements and sometimes contradicts. So we need, you know, you remember communications, communication is a package of messages, not just that's the words I use, but all of the things that go with it, my relationship to you, my tone of voice, how I place my body, all of those things go into it. You don't get more from nonverbals than from verbals, but you get additional information that allow you to have a safer inference. Liars avoid lie con eye contact and nonverbal will enable you to detect lying. That's not true. Good liars know that many people assume if you don't look at me, you must be lying. But lots of other people avoid eye contact. And in some situations, everyone will avoid eye contact. It just kind of depends on what people do to you. 
See, Colton, oh, yeah, you go going first. <laughs> Colton knew it was coming. Colton knew it was coming. And he, he held out. Mm -hmm. He held out because he knew it was coming. But our natural impulse is when someone violates our personal space, we'll, we'll look away. As kind of as a signal to them that we feel uncomfortable. But some of us feel uncomfortable even at this distance that James and I have right now. You know, it can be, I can, if I'm talking to James about something important, I may not want to look at him. Exactly, so you look outside of your eyes, yeah. Alright. Unlike verbal communication, nonverbal is universal. Play me, Carl. Play me. <laughs> Play me. <laughs> Investigate the shooter. This is what I want. Where are you going, Carl? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So sometimes it's universal. Some things are, they're not universal, but they are not as culturally scripted. Hand gestures are culturally scripted. So that this one means what? What if I'm in Greece? It means goodbye. This one means... Okay. Okay, what if I'm in Brazil? Who's, anybody been to Brazil? Don't do it. What does it mean? Exactly. It's like you're flipping them off. So those are not universal. In, in Western languages, inflection, the tone of voice, rising and falling, very much the same throughout Western languages, but Asian languages, some Asian languages, are tonal, where a rising or a falling inflection changes the whole meaning of the word. So it doesn't work quite like it does the way we express emotions in the West. When verbal and nonverbal contradict, it's wise to believe the nonverbal. We do believe the nonverbal when we have a contradiction. We do believe the nonverbal when we have a contradiction. Is it wise? Because it can be contradictory. It's not wise to take that if that's your only evidence. It's wise to check it out. When you have a contradiction between verbal and nonverbal, it's wise to check it out. Okay, not going to go over the next the next part. Functions and nonverbal. I'm not going to I'm not going to go over. But that doesn't mean that particularly that first one integrating with verbal messages is in the quiz. The channels. Again, I'm going to skip it. Channels of nonverbal, page 96. Um, very interesting things about emblems, illustrators, eye effect displays, regulators, adapters, self and other adapters, and object adapters. You should know about it. That's in the quiz. Facial management, page 98. Important stuff. The, the emoticons, this is so limited. Your, your phone, the simplest phone, now it gives you more emoticons than you can get out of that. Uh, facial and eye communication is important. Uh, we are going to use some of it. But the big stuff now is page 101, spatial communication, proxemic distances. And you notice that the work on spatial communication, proxemic distances, was begun by Edward T. Hall in books that he wrote 1959, 1963, and 1966. His 1959 work was called The Hidden Dimension. I have a copy of it. It was a kind of a seminal work in which he talked about how space functions. And he was really interested in overcrowding. That was one of the issues. And he found that when people get overcrowded, what happens to them? Well, what happens to you when you get crowded together? How do you feel? You get what? You get uncomfortable. But if you can't relieve the overcrowding, how do you feel? Well, I've got to get out. Now you're starting to get anxious. And you can't still, you felt uncomfortable, you felt anxious, you still can't get out. How do you feel? 
Scared. 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 Angry. <laughs> scared. So you begin to to have within yourself, you understand what Hall found when he studied animal populations. Now, what's the problem with Hall's work? Other than he studied animal populations and then applied it to humans. He studied human population too. He was a sociologist. What's the problem with Hall's work that should lead you to question? Because he studied animals. Take a look again at, at the very first paragraph. Space is especially important factor, nonverbal interpersonal commission communication, though we seldom think about it. Edward T. Hall, 1959-1963-1966, who pioneered the study, called it proxemics. So what's the problem with that? It was a long time ago. Is there anything else in science or social science that stands from that, from that long ago? Anything else that stands from that long ago? When did Einstein write his general theory of relativity? 13 BC? No. <laughs> Einstein! Einstein! 30s? Einstein? 30s or 40s? Earlier than that. In the teens, 1913, I believe it is. When did Newton formulate his theory of gravity? Yeah, but all of these were logical standpoints. No. General theory of relativity was not a, just a logical standpoint. It was an important mathematical breakthrough. Important mathematical breakthrough compared to communication. Well, but it's a scientific. What I'm asking you about is scientific findings. Scientific findings generally get updated more quickly than like philosophy or literature, but even our views of literature change over the decades. So when you come to a study like this that says this was done in the late 50s, early 60s, what should you be thinking as critical thinkers? Is there something more recent? Is there something more recent? Is there something more recent? So one of the things I used to do, and I'm not doing it now because I've got a couple other things I like to do. One of the things I used to do was to give people rulers and tape measures and have them in, put them in groups and test the spaces that Hall set out. Intimate distance, touching to 18 inches. Personal distance, 18 inches to about 4 feet. Social distance, 4 to 12 feet. Public distance, 12 to 25 feet. What did I find out? I found out that every time I tried it, students, even knowing that they were testing these theories, found about the same distances for where they felt comfortable with intimacy, social interaction, personal interaction, social interaction, and public interaction. You can test theories, simple theories like this yourself. And you'll often find that they will prove true. Okay. So, I'm going to put up the slideshow of what I have. We'll add to it. We'll add to it very quickly. bottom of the page, page 101, one of the things based on Altman, again a 1975 work, one of the things that we see is a, <coughs> is a description of things according to types of territories as primary territory. Areas that are yours on yours alone. 
Secondary territories, areas that don't belong to you, but you have occupied, such as your table in the cafeteria. Public territories that are open to all people. Uh, and then types of markers. We use central markers to reserve our place. We use boundary markers to mark off our space from other people's spaces. And we use earmarks as a way of indicating that we are taking possession. Trademarks, name plates, initials on a shirt or attache case are all earmarkers. Okay? So as we look at these photographs, which came from you. Did you get my photograph? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. First of all, yeah. let's try to identify, is this primary, secondary, or public territory? And are we looking at boundary, uh, uh, boundary, earmarks, or central markers? Okay. So what do we have here? What kind of territory is this? Primary. This is primary territory, right? Now what are we looking at? What kind of things are we looking at? Laptops. We got laptops. Calendar. Calendar. Things that bring ownership. Are these are these boundary markers? These boundary markers? Well, there is a boundary marker very clearly in here. This is a boundary marker. The side of the frame here. What are these? Uh, central marker. Well, isn't this more of a central marker? This is my space. But what are these? You remember initials, logos? Are their trademarks, or we're calling them earmarks because they mark the person as belonging to a particular group. Okay? So that's that's one. Is that your thing? Yes. Okay, you want to say anything about your desk? Um, well, that was before I left spring break, so it's kind of neat. Usually it's more messier. I'm a messy person. Okay. <laughs> oh, right. gosh. Who took this? <laughs> <laughs> this actually is not a marker at all. He yeah. All right, here we go. All right. What do we got here? What kind of territory? Primary. Primary territory. Primary. Okay. Have we got any boundary markers? No. We got any boundary markers? I guess the edge of the table. The edge of the desk marks clearly the boundary. But you notice what's happening up here. Here's this, here's this part of whoever this is that's taking over. It's expanding the territory. It's essentially, this is a real aggressive mood from a desk. You don't usually expect a desk to just expand territory. Right, do we have any earmarks? Do we have any earmarks? The pictures. What do the pictures do? What do the pictures do? What do pictures do on a desk? Beyond that, what do, what do these pictures do? We have we have this lovely picture here of these two young women. Wait, I didn't even see that. <laughs> you can't see that? Well, get up. And then we have this, this other young woman over here. Yeah. And we have this card up here. What do they say? What do they do? What inference may we draw? What inference may we draw? Huh? It shows you who it belongs to. So it's a, it's a earmark. What, else, what other inference may we belong? What may we draw? How does this person feel about women? It's Negative or positive? CC? It's positive. It's a very positive image of women. Yeah. Right? Okay. Let's go to the next one. All right. Primary or public space? Primary. Primary space. Okay. Boundary markers? 
<laughs> Boundary markers? That's animal. Is that a So the boundary here. Yeah, yeah. This is a lady, this is a woman's bed, so let's not make a big deal of the lotion, Stephen. <laughs> We're coming to yours soon enough. Okay. So the boundary here is where? Where's the boundary? Where's the boundary? <laughs> Do you see how the boundary is being extended? Okay. Do we have any central markers? Have a what? Central markers um, that own the space. Uh, no. Sure. 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 <laughs> Say some more, actually. Oh, I don't know. How about these guys? The pillows and, and the coverlet. I mean, women will often use this. Guys, guys, when you marry, you do not own a bedroom. You give that up. In exchange, if you have enough money, you will get a man cave. Okay? But you do not own a bedroom. The first thing that happens you and your wife decide on a bed, you will be allowed to participate in that decision because women are thoughtful creatures. Well, they're paying for it. And, and they're pay, usually paying for the bed. But, they, but they, want, they want their man to be comfortable. And beyond that, you're now done. You've decided on the bed. You don't get to decide on the placement of the bed. You don't get to decide on the dust ruffle that goes under the bed. And believe me, there will be one the duvet that goes on top of the bed, the number of pillows that there will be on the bed. And we went through, you know, we have gone through a period, it's slacking off. It's slacking off. We had this friend in Chicago, rich, rich person friend, who had this big fancy bedroom and had a party at her house. And like the pillows went from the headboard to about halfway down the bed starting with the large size, then the medium size, then the smaller size, then the mini size, just kind of going down the bed. That was not her hubby's decision. So give it up, guys. Central marker. So whose is this? Central marker. Whose is this again? That's mine. This is Cece. Cece, this is yours? OK. All right, let's go on. All right. Central. Do we have boundary markers here? Do we have boundary markers? That pillow misses it up for me. <laughs> we have a bad boundary marker. But look what's happening to the boundary. Look what's happening to the boundary. The boundary is kind of extending off. And the pillow is saying to you, look, this is mine too. I'm going to put stuff here. All right, do we have any central markers? Okay. Do we have any central markers? We have, again, we have the coverlet, we have the pillows, we have the book on top, we have whatever the heck this is on top, we have the keys, all of which are saying this is my space, right? Okay. Do you have any earmarks? Well, the lanyard is yeah. the Bethany College. Right, the lanyard is the only thing here that's, that's an earmark. <laughs> Yeah, but they're sitting in the back and they don't wear their glasses. Oh, I saw the lanyard. I just didn't see anything. All right. But that's the only earmark here. That's the only way you get a, a real identification with any specific somebody. All right, let's go on. Oh, whose is this one, by the way? It's mine. That's yours? All right, Megan. All right, here's another view of the same space. Still yours. Still, still the central boundary, central marker. The central marker for that. Yep. Oh gosh. But we have a little bit more now. We have a little bit more of a of uh, an emblematic uh, marker here because what does this say about the person? What kind of person are they? They are a are they an Apple or a PC person? They're an Apple person, right? And immediately you know something about them. From that. Okay, let's go on, Megan. Now, here we have something. 
What kind of marker is this? Huh? It's clearly an earmark. It's clearly an earmark. So Megan is saying, this is my bulletin board. I choose not to put anything on it. All right, let's go on. Aha! Look at this one. Oh! <laughs> Can I <come> Ashley? <laughs> I just want to look at your collage. The collage is great. I know. The collage is great. Everybody thinking, oh, he wants to come over, huh? Mm -hmm. Look at your pictures. <laughs> Steven, you know what I said about flirting. Oh. Yes, you are. Okay. Where are the boundaries here for, for Ashley? Is there one? Where are the boundaries for Ashley? How many both of boys are there? I want you to are there boundary markers marking the edges of her territory? The microwave. See, the microwave seems to be hers. But notice that nothing comes this way, no, nothing comes into the room off the bed. You see how carefully she has marked her boundaries here with her bed? She's lofted her bed, everything under it, and, and she doesn't encroach. She doesn't encroach upon the roommate's space. She's got a very clear and sharp boundary that only on the edges does she start to encroach a little bit. But it's clear, it's along here, this wall, up through here, but not out on the side of the bed. I'm guessing she's first floor, Warner. Okay, could be. What, are you, what earmarks have you, do you see? Thank you. What earmarks do you see? Hmm? What earmarks do you see? We got all these guys here. What do they say about this person? She likes people. What else do they say about her? Dujan says that she's bored. No, I wouldn't say bored. What about people who put who put these kinds of collagey things together. Make themselves feel at home. They like pictures. They like pictures and they're creative or artistic. So it's a creative person who likes people. Okay? Any central markers? This wild zebra bedspread. Right? Okay. Onward and upward. <laughs> Next one, please. This is your room, too, right? Okay. This is not. Okay. Boundary markers. Are there boundary markers in this part of the room? Yeah, doesn't that create a problem? There are no boundary markers, so it kind of creates a problem for us. As we look at our space, Yes, and we look here and we go, wait a minute. Okay, there is, there is this boundary here. There are some natural boundaries, but even those get encroached upon. There is a boundary. Another boundary. And we get, it's coming off, and there's this gap here between this part and the clothes on the floor. And it's like they're moving together, sort of like this monster that came out of a crack in the earth. Radioactive monster. I saw a great movie over, over the, the break. That was all about this radioactive mud monster that came out of the earth. And that's what it, this is like. It's, they're just kind of joining together. All right, whose room is this? Mine. So, Bobby, are we right? That, that in your room, the boundary are, are either very fluid or don't exist? I'm surprised it's that clean on this Yeah. Hey, it's lucky oh. now. Okay. <laughs> the boundary things are like the shelves right there. Yeah. But otherwise, it just kind of flows yeah. into the rest of the Since room on the floor. That, we just throw stuff on there. All right, onward and upward. <coughs> Here we have some interesting boundaries, don't we? And some inter and an interesting central marker. You notice the central marker here? What do you notice about it? That's a central marker. What do you notice about it? What does this person have on their bed? <laughs> what does this person have on her bed? Colors. Um, colors that are coordinated. Coordinated <laughs> colors. And we have 
we have a duvet or, or quilt, mm -hmm. and then what, what do we have here? We have a microfiber <laughs> blanket. Okay, so so the boundary or the the central marker here, guys. What is the central marker here? Tell us about this person. Neat. Neat. That she cleaned up for that. What? Coordinating. Coordinated. Coordinated. She has a she has a sense of style. If we were, let's say, to go to Brad's room and we found something like this, what would we say about Brad? What inference would we draw about Brad? A little bit gay. <laughs> you know what? And that's unfair. That's totally unfair. But but you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It is what people would now say, and it's totally unfair because guys can guys can also be color coordinated. There we go. Guys, not that color coordinated. What? What? It might not be those colors. It might not be those colors. Yeah, in a different color. They may, they may be, you know, like dark blue and, and a, say, a no. dark blue microfiber. And no. Can no. guys be as neat? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. What do we see about... What do we